Wall Street Mastermind. Excited to be back today with another client interview for you guys. Um, and extra excited because you know, today we have Emma on with us. And, uh, you know, I'm going to let her introduce herself in a second here. But, you know, Emma is uh, just finished going through, I guess it was the summer 20, summer, uh, summer 2022 recruiting process, right? Um, and, you know, she was able to get a very successful outcome. And uh, she's one of our Canadian clients, which, um, you know, most of the students we work with are in the U.S., but we've also worked with some Canadian students as well. So I thought I'd get her to come on here, talk to you guys about uh, how the recruiting process is like up, up north. And, um, you know, there's some slight differences with how it works here in the U.S. And hopefully this interview helps you, those of you who are uh, planning on recruiting, uh, planning on recruiting in Canada yourself. So. Emma, I want to thank you first and foremost for taking the time to be here with us today. And uh, if you can, maybe just start off by uh, introducing yourself a little bit and telling people who you are. Of course. Thanks, Sam. Um, so my name is Emma. I am doing currently doing my MBA, uh, expecting to graduate in May uh, at a um, MBA program in Toronto. And a bit about me would be uh, I come from a background in economics. I did stats and econometrics at Waterloo and went into investment management after um, taking a bit of finance courses and doing a finance stream in my undergrad. Went into investment management, worked there for about um, four years in a research and analysis role, supporting the, the sales team on an investment group. And from there, I realized that I didn't want to necessarily be in the investment management space at that time. I wanted to pivot and be a bit more into the deal space. Uh, was interested in actually working with business owners helping them build up their strategies um, and be more part of the decision-making process. Uh, in investment management, I was working with high net worth clients. And so a lot of these clients were actually business owners themselves. And so that's really what sparked the idea for me. And then uh, chose to do the MBA, just given my background in economics and a bachelor's degree. Um, chose to do an MBA at a top business school in Toronto in order to really make the pivot and also build the managerial skill set and the business knowledge that I, uh, I guess, in a way I felt I was missing from my undergrad. So that's what brought me here. Got it, got it. Okay, that makes sense. And so you knew you wanted to do investment banking prior to going to business school, like going to business school was the reason, or actually the reason for going to business school is to help you pivot into investment banking, is that right? Yes, so yeah, I could probably unpack that a little bit, but um, the two, two entry routes to get into investment banking, at least in Toronto, would be number one is through your undergrad doing a co-op and getting a, that summer internship and then getting placement. Or number two is at the MBA level and doing it the same way, but also but getting into the associate role. So um, knew that was the entry point and saw the MBA as the best way to you know tackle both things, the managerial skill set, but also getting the job that I wanted. Got it. Okay. So then like you got into the business school and then like what were some of the things you were doing initially to kind of like work towards this goal, I guess, like prior to joining Wall Street Mastermind even, like I'm sure you were doing a bunch of stuff on your own, right? So like, what were some of the things you were doing or what were some of the resources that you were using um, to kind of prepare for the process? Mm -hmm. So the school has a really big, um, you know, most, most of their candidates go into financing or consulting. So the financing clubs are really strong and the network and alumni groups are, really supportive. And so I did, I think it was four or five case competitions within the first term. So that was from September to December of my first year. Um, did four case competitions and those were all like investment banking, like simulation type case competition. So it's, you have this mandate, spend the weekend analyzing these two companies and propose a structure, uh, a financing structure for them, or, you know, assess whether or not this deal makes sense. And you work in teams. And so that really helped me get my feet um, into a position where I could see this is actually what like the investment banking associate would be doing over the summer, obviously maybe in <laughs> over a week or a few months period, but it still really gave me the chance to see what their, what the job was like. And then another big part that I was working on was taking finance, financial modeling courses. So I took about seven of those to really understand like uh -huh. M&A structuring, leverage buyouts. Um, the school has like a, there is actually a really good, um, financial modeling and skill set. Um, they're called the Marquee Group in Toronto. And so they have a lot of offerings. And so they're a really big resource and they have connections with the school. So I got in with them, um, did a bunch of those. And then also did a bunch of like 
free modeling type of like CFI type courses to really try and get my reps in. Um, I also did a lot of networking. I did start off doing a lot of networking at, at the beginning, but as I kind of went through my uh, first year, I, re I ended up doing like probably a hundred networking calls, but in my first term, I probably only did 15 to 20. I didn't realize like the impact of it, but it was really helpful, at least in the two jobs I had were both through networking. So you can see how it pays off. Um, and then in terms of like mock interviews, the school also, the club helps helps you prepare for them. And so they send you um, a bunch of resources and they help you get through like a few mock interviews, but I didn't necessarily use those as much as possible. And so that's probably where, um, you know, I, I would say that was that was my mistake in the end. I probably should have used the networking a bit more and also the mock interviews that were provided, provided by the school to get the summer internship. But uh, in the end, I didn't have that. Got it, got it, okay. I gotta say like, you know, out of um, the, the clients that we've worked with, I feel like you are probably one of the, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You're like one of the most prepared clients coming into the program, meaning like, the amount of work you had already done on your own, like seven financial modeling courses. I think that's like the most that I've ever heard from anyone. And so like, I guess like that begs the question and probably a lot of people are wondering like, okay, so you're already doing all these things and you got, you know, clubs on campus, you got, uh, you know, your school resources, you got the marquee group, you got CFI, you got all these things. Um, like what made you want to, I guess, add Wall Street Mastermind to that and, you know, sign up for yet another, another program, you know, to, to kind of help you prepare with the process. Like what was the, what was the thought process or what was the rationale, I guess? I think I, I knew for me that when it came down to interviews, I was as much as I read and as much as preparation I had, I didn't prepare enough on the actual, let's do a mock interview and let's see how my responses sound, uh, make sure my communication's clear. Am I actually understanding these answers or am I just rehearsing? Um, or reciting what I know from the breaking into Wall Street IB 400 questions. And so for me, it was that preparation in terms of actual um, verbally saying these questions out loud. I knew them all from writing them down. If I had a test, I could do it. It was, for me, it was, yeah, having the time to actually formulate my questions in a short period um, or like in a, you know, one to two minute time frame. And uh, I think just my nerves really got got the better of me. And so I wasn't as successful in my interviews because of that. Uh, you mean the interviews that you had prior to Wall Street Mastermind? That is right, yeah. Got it. What were, like, so you had already recruited before coming to us, it sounds like. Like, can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, what was, like, how many, how many interviews did you go through and like, what was, what was the outcome? I guess like you didn't get the offer, it sounds like, which is, or else you wouldn't have come to us. Yeah, so I didn't get any investment banking summer position offers. I did get a bunch of, uh, I did also interview in like venture capital and private equity. I ended up landing a really good position in a private equity firm after going through the, so pretty much investment banking interviews go from the second week of January to usually the third week. And that's like, those are the big banks in Toronto, like those are done. Um, after that point, uh, the private equity firms and sometimes other like venture capital type businesses will come to campus. And so have, knowing my experience, knowing that I didn't, I went through the interview process and I wasn't selected in the end. So knowing that for the investment banking, so knowing that outcome, I realized, okay, I really need to like hunker down here and actually get um, my reps in on interviews. And so I put that forward, got a private equity summer position, but they typically don't hire someone without investment banking. And so um, I knew it was just gonna be a summer position. And I mean, I was planning just to use that as a really great experience to see how a private equity firm works, how they interact with the investment banks and use that uh, to get back into investment banking. And so that's what I decided to do, but to get back into investment banking, even though I had good experience, I have a good level of knowledge. I still need that interview prep. And so that's why I picked Wall Street Mastermind to really help me get there. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so for your summer internship, you didn't get the summer associate job, but you got a PE job, which is still pretty relevant to banking but your goal is always to recruit again for a full-time associate position, basically at the end of your summer between your first and second year, basically. That's right, yeah. Okay. And I mean, cause look, I think like this is, a, this is a good point, which is a lot of people, I think they don't realize this, but 
it's not like you're a bad candidate and it's not like you were, I wouldn't say you were bad at interviewing. Like you got like a private equity job, which is still not easy to get. But a lot of people, what they don't realize is like, especially in Canada, like Canada is not a big market when it comes to like investment banking. And so there are like very few, uh, there are fewer banks, first of all, but then like even within each bank, there are like very few positions. Like it's not like the US where you apply to New York and there are, you know, thousands of jobs or whatever, right? And so there's like only so many jobs, like a handful of jobs. And the difference between the person who got the job and sometimes the person who didn't get the job, but got the interview, it's not like a night and day difference. You know, like people think like, people think like, oh, I need to like, I, I like the, like I need to like improve by so much uh, because I didn't get the job. Like, no, like a lot of times, like the changes you're, the improvements that you're making, it's just like, it's the marginal things that are like just around the edges, right? And at the same time, like those types of improvements I think are the hardest, right? Because mm -hmm. you've already like picked off all the low hanging fruit and now you're talking about like really nuanced changes to your answer or sometimes not even your answer, but like the, the, your delivery or whatever. And I think like when it comes to interviewing, it's really, really hard to like identify what those improvements need to be on your own because they're not the obvious, it's not the obvious things, right? Like the obvious things you, you've already identified them and you've already fixed them. Now you're like, okay, I was close, but I just need that like one extra little push and I know I'm good enough. Mm -hmm. But like, but like it's, at that point, it's like, okay, then you need someone who's maybe more experienced and, and, and maybe can point those things out to you or just like a third party perspective as opposed to like, cause we're so, when we're the ones that are interviewing, like we're so like, we're, we're too involved, right? It, it's, yeah. hard to, it's hard to like see like, oh yeah, like I'm, the way I'm saying this, like could be a little bit better. Cause like, obviously like, however you were saying things before, that's already you putting your best foot forward. Mm -hmm. right? Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, I definitely thought it was. Like I, I still knew I had stuff to learn, but at the same time, I didn't think I was that different from the other candidates. Yeah. Um, and so like, I knew it was like a close, it was a matter of being, you know, <laughs> second or third probably in the, the roundup and which in, at the end, like, I think this is probably a good point for most candidates. Like year to year, the recruiting can change so much. Like in, in Toronto last year, I would say maybe there was maybe 20 positions at the MBA level went to investment banks, 20 positions. Th those schools in Toronto have around 400 candidates each and there's many there's a few schools and so if you think about it like my school probably placed only five or six students wow. and uh this year we've placed 20 at the school so it was also like a like covid was a <laughs> and there's, there's there's other things that happen but um you know the mba candidates now going into associate programs if the staff are at that bank it doesn't have his mba they or sorry they don't have their mba um, they could also have a different opinion in terms of recruiting associates at the MBA level. They might want to recruit analysts up before they think about MBA students. And so there's many different factors that lead into, yeah, the recruiting numbers and it doesn't always reflect on you. Yeah. So. Your school plays 20 people at the MBA level this year. Yeah. <laughs> so isn't that like the entire market? <laughs> there's, pro there's probably 40 positions this year. Oh, okay. So, cause, cause there's a lot more deal for this year. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, like market conditions always play a role, right? Like when things are booming and there's a lot of deal activity and whatever, like people are going to hire more. Mm -hmm. um, like I graduated in 2008 and I was like, I experienced the opposite of that where like no one was hiring and it was really, really hard. And so obviously there's some, um, that's like out of our control when you graduate, there's a little bit of luck involved, but aside from that though, whether it's 20 positions or 40 positions, Bottom line is like, it's not a lot, right? And then for you too, like recruiting for full-time also puts you at a slight disadvantage because whatever positions are available, they're first gonna get filled by the summer, summer associates who did an internship at those banks. And if they do a good job, they kind of have first dibs on these offers, right? Exactly. And like, you're kind of like, by the time you were interviewing, usually what these banks have maybe like one spot left that they're trying to fill. Is, is yeah. And you're up against other analysts. 
from other banks too, right? Like you're, the pool is not just strictly at whatever bank has that co-op placement or sorry, whatever, um, yeah, co-op placement is happening. Now you're, the pool of candidates is way wider. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. Like other analysts that want to stay in banking and get promoted to associates, um, they're gonna be going for these spots too. So yeah. that's a good point. So I guess, um, that all makes sense. So then like you came into Walsh and Mastermind, I think back in like September, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I think you got your offer in December? November. It? November, okay, yeah. yeah. So it was like relatively quick. It was like a two month process where I feel like, you know, you were just like sprinting to, to like you know, do all the things you need to do. But like, what were some of the things that we worked on in those two months? And like, what did you find to be most helpful, I guess, for your process? I think as I've talked about it before, like the whole interview process, I didn't know where, I knew where my gaps were. Like if I wasn't answering the question right, you can clearly identify that that's, okay, I need to go back over that material. I'm not answering that right. Those are easy things to fix. Um, the behaviorals, the how I'm presenting myself, and also just under making sure that I actually um, ha have a bit, have an overall level of um, understanding of the content instead of just knowing the answers. And so over those two months, I think it really helped me to see how those answers were actually answered through some of your uh, video sessions, uh, watching you know previous candidates get mocked into inter mock interviews done. Um, just seeing how other people are in that process because it's one thing to get feedback and like my friends would mock me before these interviews and it, they were you know they would ask me really good questions they would give me some feedback but it was never this is how I would you know not, not actually like breaking down how am I how am I responding to this answer how could I make it more clear um, how is my presence in the interview how is um, you know all those other little things like when I saw how you would answer some of these questions and you would provide tips as to don't say everything up front, right? Like if they ask you what beta is, just explain what beta is. Don't dive into what the capital asset pricing model is. Or like, you know, like those little things that sometimes you'll say just because you know it, um, it doesn't come off well. It doesn't, it sounds like you don't know it enough. So you're just saying everything that you can and just like throwing it at the person. And so um, those little tips that, you know, you hear it and you're like, that's so obvious. I should have known that beforehand, but um, th th that really helped me. And then doing a few mock interviews um, I think it was like the team was great in terms of my interview process was so random. Like I was speaking to an MD one day and then they were like, okay, on Monday, um, do you want to get into our interview process? And it was like, okay, when's your interview process tomorrow at 12 PM. And I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. So reaching out to the, to the wall street, uh, mastermind team and saying, okay, I really need a mock interview. Just to, like, I've been mocking the whole time, but it was just like, can you guys just like fit me in for one hour, you know, before my interview and, uh, you know, having a, a big a big team at Wall Street Mastermind and being able to fill that fill that need uh, really quickly was super helpful for me, and um, I think that's what really helped me get through the get through the process. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think like a couple of good points there was just like your example about like, hey, you know, even on technical questions when they ask you something and kind of withholding certain information, even if you know it, and letting them ask you the follow up. It's like. Like you said, that's not like an obvious thing or that's not like an intuitive thing to do. But going back to our point earlier, it's like at this point, at the level that you're at, like we're trying to identify the non-obvious things that you can improve on. Like all the obvious things, like you've already done it, right? And so, but like it's stuff like that that can that can make a difference uh, when, it, when, it be, when it comes to like, are you the the best candidate at super day or are you like the runner up right like sometimes it's just like it's, it's that is that marginal um but then also like on the mock interview side of things i think like and i like we always encourage people like do as many mock interviews as you can with upperclassmen with friends with whoever so only do it with you but i think like one consistent feedback that we've gotten from our clients and i don't know if this is your experience as well is that you know when you do mock interviews with friends um one, a lot of times your friends are like kind of about at like at the at the level that you're at in terms of interviewing. So like right. when they're critiquing you, you, a lot of times the 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 feedback is not going to be that in depth or not not going to be that helpful because to them your answers like there's not there's there's not much to improve, right? Or like they don't they don't really have anything to say. Or sometimes it's the other reason is like 
when you're mock interviewing with someone just like your friend or whatever, like they don't want to go too hard on you and they don't want to like make you feel bad. And then so they're just like, oh yeah, that was pretty good or like whatever, right? But like a lot of our clients tell us like when they get a mock interview, what they actually want is like, hey, go as hard as you can on me and like, like nitpick every little thing that I could be doing better because ultimately that's what's going to actually make you better. Not like, you know, ha- not like having your interviewer you know, feel bad about giving you uh, constructive criticism or whatever, right? And so like, right. we're not shy about doing that. Like, we feel like our job is to nitpick every little thing and <laughs> just like, we don't wanna leave anything on the table if there's something that, because again, our belief is that it's all in the margins. And so like, there's no, there's no feedback or con- constructive criticism that's like too insignificant to mention, mm-hmm. right? And and that's kind of like our mentality. And I think like, you know, in the end, like it does make a difference on the, on the results that our clients end up getting, right? Yeah. And so just to add to that, like the office hours, like you would do like behavioral, like some people would have, like some students or some uh, candidates in your program would have uh, like an interview the next day. And so they'd jump on the, to the hot seat. And uh, sometimes I wasn't able to make all those just to have my class schedule, but I would watch the recordings or like if I was there, I took like such detailed notes on just the feedback that you would give to some of these candidates in the hot seat. Like, you know, I wasn't brave enough to get myself there, but uh, it was still good to really see like, just critiquing someone's um, career story. Like it's, it's, that's the first, that's the first thing you say in an interview and it's so important. It really sets a tone for everything else that goes on. And so if you don't have a good career story, it doesn't make any sense. You're not answering the right questions up front. Um, I think that really can set the whole interview into one direction or the other. And so I think, like listening to some of those, your feedback and like even uh, the other coaches uh, that like I took away those and I brought them to my my career store and made sure that that was, it was tighter. That's like, that's awesome. Cause I think like the mock interview hot seat, the reason why we do it, it's, I, I haven't really seen anyone else do it, but I, I feel like the reason why we added it is, you know, when most people prep for interviews, they're just thinking about what they're going to say themselves. And it's almost like they have blinders on and they're not thinking about anybody else. But in reality, when you think, especially something like the behavioral interview, I mean, technical interview too, but like even more so for the behavioral interviews, like it's not about whether your answer is like the right answer or not. There's no such thing. It's about whether your answers are better than your competition's answers. And so like most people have no idea how their competition's answering these questions or what their competition sounds like or, there's there's no like calibration going on it's like hey how do i stack up against other people or how good are my answers relative to other people's answers mm-hmm. and so like being able to like actually observe other people's mock interviews and hear the feedback that we're giving other people even though they're going to have different answers than you at a minimum that gives you a, a better sense of like okay hey like there's still room for me to get better or like sometimes you so as you uh, see someone mock interview and they're not as good as you, that happens too. But like a lot of times, like you might see someone who's maybe ahead of where you're at. And I think that experience is very eye-opening for a lot of candidates because most people come in and they think like, oh yeah, my behavior answer is already pretty good. Like everyone always feels that way. And until they see someone whose behavior answer is like even better than theirs and they're like, oh, okay, actually there's another level. So it's like, okay, now like I have something to strive towards. So it's like, if you can't visualize what that looks like, and you don't know what to even work on, but like once you hear it or see it one time, then you can visualize it and you're like, oh, okay, all right, like now I know like what I need to do, right? And so I think that's like one piece of the preparation process that a lot of people just, um, I mean, they, I guess it's hard to do it, right? Outside of something like, like Wall Street Mastermind, right? because it's not like, you know, other people are going to tell you like, oh yeah, this is how I'm answering my questions. <laughs> like, you know, like they're, they're trying to get the jobs. They're not trying to help you get the jobs, right? And so I think like that's a, that's a really, really good point, which is like just being a part of a community like this and having other people who are also going, working towards the same goal at the same time mm-hmm. as you and then being able to kind of like just learn from each other. I think that's really, really powerful. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's good stuff. So I guess like, can we, like, what was the, what was like the successful outcome for you in the end? Like at the end of all this, like, obviously you went through a lot of interview prep, you've done a ton of networking. Um, 
Yeah, and then like, you know, you went through several interviews, right? You interviewed with a couple different places, is that right? Yeah, um, all the same bank. I, I chose my bank I really wanted to work at and uh, kept networking around the different teams there and uh, ended up getting a position as an associate in a mid-market investing group. Uh, so pretty excited about that. I worked in private equity mid-market before and uh, in Canada, at least, it's really cross-border yeah. transactions uh, rather than some of the other groups would be a bit more concentrated in Canada. So I did want that um, you know, American exposure and uh, it's mostly M&A. So that was also like a big one for me. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, personally, I think that the M&A side is much more interesting than the capital market side, but that's just me. I mean, some people like capital markets, but I think that m and is just more strategic in terms of like the thought that you have to put into the deal. And also it's a lot more technical, right? I mean, you haven't done seven financial modeling courses, like I think you'll be well prepared for that. But like on the capital market side, um, usually there's like not too much modeling going on. And so uh, it's just a different, it's just a, it's just a different experience, different skill set, I think. But, but I think that's a great fit for you, honestly. I mean, with your background and, and doing doing middle market PE and then you know all of your modeling skills and all that, I think I think you'll be a great fit there. So um, I guess like one last question for you. Uh, what is like, do you have like one piece of advice that you can kind of like pass on to the people that are kind of going through the process now after like maybe someone who's also an MBA student, also trying to recruit in Canada or whatever, right? Like someone who's now uh, in your shoes or at least where you were before, like, was there a piece of advice that maybe someone gave you along the way that really, really helped you um, or kind of like made, made a big difference for you that you can like share with other people? Yeah, so actually, um, <laughs> I'm going to structure this in how I would structure like most of my behavioral questions. It's I always do things in three, and I think it's like a really nice way to structure these answers. So I have three takeaways. So my first would be uh, do as much research as you can. Like when I networked with people and actually figured out what are the pain points of an associate in investment banking, what are the pain points of an analyst or the v or the VP, and so when you're having conversations with them in a networking or an interview session, knowing what pain points what they let you know, how they work with other people on the team, how they're like an associate is in a way leading the analyst and showing mentorship um, and helping them get to the next stage. A VP is really overseeing that whole process. And so um, in terms of like a lot of projects, a big thing is teamwork. And so thinking about how can you show off your teamwork abilities in the interview? How can you show off, um, you know, your ability to fit in with the team's culture? Like you're working with people all day. And so like just trying to identify the pain points and uh, and just the bigger, big factors with the uh, day on the job. Um, number two would be at the MBA level, I found that the break into Wall Street questions are great. I've never been asked a single one of those questions in an interview. And uh, maybe it's just like at the associate level, like they're looking for people a bit more experience. So know those questions, know how, know why the answer is is what it is but also be able to build on to that. And so I think that that was the gap for me. It was trying to take my corporate finance knowledge to the next level. And so maybe just be a bit more prepared in that sense um, in knowing that those questions are typically not the ones that turn up on the, at least the full-time interview, interview uh, questions. No. Um, and then number three would be, oh, I just had it. Um, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had something else. Um, okay, I, I'm forgetting it now, but um, okay. I, guess the, I guess the third tip would just be, yeah, spend, like, you're paying for this Wall Street Mastermind uh, program. Like, use the resources as best as possible. Like, the um, the presentations and the PowerPoint slides that you I would download, and I would write out all the notes and like how you were answering the questions. And that really helped me understand how I should be structuring my answers, like mm -hmm. attend all the office hours, um, you know, spend time with different coaches and really figure out. And like, I'm a planner. So like I had an Excel model, like all laid out on like what I wanted to accomplish like each week and like how many times I did reps on like the m and the LBO, all those different sections. Um, and, uh, you know, behaviorals are so important. I think a lot of people put those to the side, but spend a lot of time preparing those. Um, like I reached out to my career coach at my school 
to help me with the behavioral interview prep on the side of also doing all the technicals and the behaviorals through mock interviews. And I think it's really important to get those behaviorals down. Um, so third one would, to sum that up is plan well and use the resources and at least like get a lay of the lands of like all the resources that the program offers and then put those into a schedule for yourself and make sure that you're hitting those goals. That's great. Um, I asked for one piece of advice, you got three, which is amazing. Um, you know, on that second point about like the breaking the Wall Street questions, I don't even think it's like an associate level thing. I think like we're finding that to be true across the board for most of our clients, which is nowadays, I think the interviewers have adapted because, you know, maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, when these guys were still relatively new, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was an advantage if you read these guys and memorize the questions and you were already ahead of the curve. But nowadays, like everyone, every single person that's recruiting has those guys. Every single person is reading, I guarantee you. I do not know one person who's serious about investment making who has not read those guys. And like the interviewers know that too. And it really doesn't do anything for them to just like ask the exact same questions that are from those guys because everyone's already memorized those, those, those answers. Like it doesn't help them make the, make, it doesn't help them separate like the, the candidates that truly understand these concepts from the ones that are just memorizing and, and don't really understand what's going on, right? And so in my experience, they actually are deliberately going out of their way to not just ask you the questions from those guys, right? That's why we always harp on this. We, we always tell people like, do not just memorize answers to 400 questions and then think like that's what you, that's like, what it's going to take the ACs interview is like if you do that, you're not going to get the same questions. And if you don't actually understand the concepts, you're just not, you're going to get tripped up. Like every question they ask is going to feel like a curveball question, right? Even though it's not. So uh, I think that's really, really great advice. Um, but, you know, guys, I think like if, if you guys are um, listening to this and, you know, maybe you are like recruiting for, uh, up in Canada and like you understand how competitive it is up there, there's not a lot of jobs. Um, and maybe you're even already a pretty good candidate like Emma is, but you understand that like, hey, like you just need to improve a little bit more, right? You just need that extra push, you know, not that you haven't done the work, not that you, you're not good enough or not a qualified candidate, but like, it's just that competitive and you want that extra bit of help to just kind of like put you over the top. Then uh, and I would encourage you guys to reach out, schedule a call with our team. Let's just have a chat see what your situation is, what are your goals, what do you actually need help with, and we can figure out together if we can actually help you with those things or not, and if we can, we would love to help you. If we can't, at a minimum, we can give you some advice on what we think you should do instead, um, but either way, if that's something that you'd be interested in, um, you can go and book this call with us at www.wallstreetnational.com slash apply. Um, the street's abbreviated to ST, so it's wallstmastermind.com slash apply. And uh, we look forward to speaking with you, okay? Um, but with that said, Emma, I want to thank you for uh, coming on here and sharing so many useful uh, nuggets with you know our listeners and just insights on how the investment making recruiting process works in Canada. Uh, I think, honestly, you are a great candidate and uh, the firm that hired you is, is lucky to have you. And uh, you know, I can't wait to see the, all the success that you have uh, as a banker going forward. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, guys, um, that's going to be it for this episode. We're going to wrap it up here. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, we'll be back with more of these for you guys in the near future. All right. Talk soon.